I think, you know, we were at a men's breakfast a few years ago, and I went around the table and I said, guys, what makes your wife the happiest? When, what's going to make her feel the safest? Because women typically in marriages want to be secure and men want to be respected. Like that's right out of Ephesians chapter 5. And we went all the way around the table, and obviously, you know, things like the bills being paid definitely helps, and, and all, the, all the habitual things we do. And when I did mine, I said, well, this is an easy one. The, the thing that makes my wife the happiest is when she knows that I'm praying and I'm in the Word, because that's where it all starts. And if I'm not praying and I'm not in the Word, she picks up on it. When you marry a prophet, let me tell you, it's really good, but you can't hide anything. And that's a good thing. Right? That's a good thing, because so she could tell if my attitude was a little agitated, if I wasn't really hearing from the Lord, and what a valuable thing that is to have in your life, a person who will just speak honestly to you. And, and it's not a hard thing to hear from the Lord, because if it was a hard thing, he wouldn't be a good father. But if you're a good father, you want to talk to your children, and you want them to talk to you, so you're not going to be a distant God. And people will say, well, I don't know, I've tried it, and I've prayed, and and, and I don't have a, a quick formula answer for you other than to say, keep trying. Because he will make yourself, himself real to you if you'll just keep listening. And, and like I said, it's, uh, I, I've quoted it often. Heidi Baker is married to a man named Roland Baker. And his grandfather was a famous missionary in China way back in the days when missions was not a common thing. And he was working with an orphanage in China where the kids were escaping the coal mines dying at 9 and 10 years old, and their only hope to live was to escape, and they would find their way to the, to the missionary uh, uh, outpost that he had. And the, the Lord showed up miraculously. I, I believe it's called Visions Behind the Veil. And the last name is Baker. I don't remember his first name. Somebody might know here. Uh, Rollin is the son. I don't remember the grandfather's name. Um, but it's, it's an amazing book because... They took the children. They didn't really believe him at first that the Lord had appeared to all of them. And they brought them into separate rooms and asked them the same questions. And none of these children had any education at all. They told the exact same story. And there was a revival in that little mission house. So if God will show up to these little children that were dying in the coal mines of China, he'll show up to you. And that's what the grandfather said to Rowan that he never forgot. was that, that verse from Matthew 25. In that you do it to the least of these, my brethren. You do it what? You do it unto the Lord. So when you're looking at another human being, you're looking into the face of divinity in there somewhere. They're made in the image of God. And that's what the grandfather said. Nowhere on earth, I couldn't imagine there's any more least than these. And the Lord showed up. So look, that's a good thing, isn't it? Isn't that good news? That he's not a distant God, angry. You don't have to keep trying to appease him with your offerings and killing some sacrifice. That you could just come to him as a father and say, Abba, I need to hear your voice today. So that's what it's been about. A couple of weeks ago, I did My Faith Will Not Fail. This is when the Lord spoke to Peter. And he said, you're going to fail me, but your faith is not going to fail because I'm going to pray for you. Remember? He predicted that Peter would, would deny him three times. And Peter did, even though Peter said, no, I won't. And it's okay, it's okay, I'm going to pray for you. And when you come back, you're going to strengthen your brothers. I can relate, can you? And then there's this awesome verse of 1 John 3.20 that says, When our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. So we don't have to live in that shame of making mistakes and the regret. And that's a part of being a Christian. He's, God is close to those with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. It's okay to come to the Lord and say, I'm sorry I let you down. I know the way I behaved yesterday is not the way I want to be. Will you help me? That's a broken spirit and a contrite heart because you recognize you can't do it in your own strength. Then last week it was the prayer journey from knowing to growing. Luke 18.1 talks, starts the parable about the persistent widow. Remember this one? And she goes to the judge and she's relentless. And he ignores her at first. And Jesus says, listen... If the unjust judge will, will eventually give the widow what you want, how much more will your Father in heaven when you keep on praying? How much more? God is not the unjust judge. You know that, right? He's a loving Father. And maybe you've had prayers that haven't been answered, but I'm saying just be like that persistent widow. 
Keep on bringing that need to the Lord. Keep on saying, while I'm waiting, I'm going to prosper while I'm waiting to get the answer to that prayer. I'm not letting the devil steal my joy. That's where my strength comes from. And then I already told you. So I'm just going to unpack Acts 17 a little bit where we started. Remember what it said, these troublemakers come, they have a political insurrection, they want to overthrow Caesar's government, and you know, we know from Ephesians that we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, come on, you know it, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. So we're, we're told throughout the New Testament that there's a lot more going on than just the natural realm. That there's a spiritual war going on too. And boy, if that hasn't been evident in the last nine months, where have you been? Because it's so evident when, when fear is hijacking somebody, that's a spiritual attack. And don't give him that ground. Don't give him the peace of your heart. My peace I give you, Jesus said. My peace I give you. Don't let the devil rob that peace from you. And that doesn't mean that there aren't scary things happening. It means he's given us the equipping and the tools to know how to deal with it. And he stays as my king. He stays enthroned on the throne of my heart, not the world, not the sinking sand. So this says in the voice, there were riots going on in Thessalonica. And in verse 5, it says, seeing this movement was growing, the Christians were starting to grow. They were attracting a lot of people. I wonder why. Because they had good news. And because they were full of the Holy Spirit. And the people that saw them knew them before they were Christians and now see them after. And they're like, what happened to you? Something's different about you. I got saved, and I'm glowing with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's the best evangelism that there is. Let them see the change in your life. Pray for them, and they'll get healed. They'll believe God's real, because he is. So they saw the movement grow, and these are the enemies of the early church. And the unconvinced Jewish people became protective and angry. What were they trying to protect? their principalities and their powers, right? That's that spirit that's in operation. And whatever the entrenched principality is, it doesn't want to give ground to the kingdom of God. So what if you're in a business and there's some, uh, I don't know, shady business going on? Anybody have shady business going on in your company? Not by you, of course, but something that you might see. And you're not always sure how to attack that kind of thing, are you? Well, prayer's a good way to start. And say, Lord, just show me what the strategy is because I don't want to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, but this is where you have me right now. So instead of me being impacted negatively by them, let me be a positive impact on them. And expose, like Trisha said, expose the corruption so that it gets uncovered. God, God loves that prayer. He's a God of justice. He wants to see it exposed. So this principality in Thessalonica was not happy that the Christians were here, and they take it out on, on this guy Jason. They found this version, says, some ruffians hanging out in the marketplace and convinced them to start a riot. Selah. <laughs> Been some riots in America for the last few months, right? Some people getting paid to go riot. <laughs> Amazing. So they found some ruffians in the, in the marketplace and convinced them to start a riot. And soon a mob formed and the whole city was seething with tension. Sounds a lot like America today, doesn't it? Seething with tension. The mob was going street by street looking for Paul and Silas, who are the leaders of this new troublemaking band that was turning the world upside down. But they were nowhere to be found. Frustrated, the mob came to the house of Jason, who was now known as a believer. Jason was now known as a man who had a different king, and the king's name was Jesus. Wouldn't that be a great way for people to know you on your job? Like how the unsaved people would look at you and say, well, I don't know about her, man. She's operating from a different kingdom. She's got a different king named Jesus. And, and she claims that Jesus gave her his spirit to live on the inside. Sounds pretty good to me. I don't want to depend on my spirit. I know where that takes me, what ditch I ended up in with that person driving the wheel, steering it. Uh-uh, I want you, Lord. I want you on that throne. So they grabbed this guy, Jason, and some of the believers, and they found, they dragged him out to the city officials and said, these people are political agitators. <laughs> so how do you think that fits into the culture of America right now where churches aren't supposed to talk about politics? Right? Like, this is, this is the exact charge that was being brought against the early church, is that they don't want to submit to the heathen rules. And we're saying the same thing. We're not going to submit to the heathen rules, no matter who's in the Supreme Court, no matter who's in the White House or who's in the Senate. You have to have a line that you draw and say, no, I'm not crossing that line. Do with me whatever you have to do. 
Take away the tax-exempt status if you have to. I don't care. I don't think the Apostle Paul cared about losing the tax-exempt status in the book of Acts. He would not even know what the heck we're talking about. And the irony is the church has flourished through persecution. And we're not suffering persecution the way some people are in different parts of the world, right? So let's just keep that in perspective and recognize not this as a, a horrible time, but as an amazing opportunity to talk to people. And if what you have is as good as you think it is, you should be able to convince them that they should try a different way to live. That there's another king, and his name is Jesus. You don't have to follow the political system or the ways of the world or all of the, I would just say, the, the different philosophies that are trying to normalize sin. That's what the world is trying to do. That's what the devil has always tried to do. They don't want boundaries. Anything goes to the point of such ludicrous statements that are being made that there's no biological difference between a man and a woman. And your taxes are going to pay children that curriculum in a school. They could just pick whatever they want to be, boy or girl. I mean, they're just completely, blatantly violating science and saying that science isn't even true anymore because this is how much the heathen are raging. You know, from Psalm 2, right? Verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? Why do they plot a vain thing? The vain thing is thinking you can live without God. How many times do you have to make the same mistake over and over? And they keep falling into the same trap. Well, I'll just live together with her for a while to see if it's a good match. It doesn't matter to them that all the statistics from the unsaved psychologists are saying there's a higher failure rate if you live with somebody before you marry them. They don't care why, because pride rises up and says, well, that might be everybody else, but not me. Oh, man, pride comes before the stumble and the fall. There's a reason these rules make sense. Marriage is sacred. It's a holy thing between a man and a woman. Why is this controversial? <laughs> oh, my God. It's amazing, isn't it? But the culture wants to normalize sin. It's, oh, no, no, that's your, that's your truth. That's old. Well, it is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And if you don't believe that, well, we'll try to convince you otherwise. God is in control. He tells us these things for our protection because he's a good father and he loves us. And, and Paul said, you know, if you join yourself to someone else in, the act, in a sexual act, you become in one with that person. And you don't want to do that unless that person has committed their life to you and to the Lord and say, you know what? It, it could get a little rough during the ride here, but I'm with you until death do us part. I'm not leaving. Divorce is not an option. We're going to stay in this thing together. I go, that could sound a little harsh, I know, but... I'm just telling you, that's a great way to look at it. Trisha and I have followed that path for 35 years, and she hung in there with me. <laughs> I think they asked, uh, who was a Billy Graham's wife, have you ever considered divorce? And she said, divorce, no. Murder, yes. <laughs> I think Trish could probably say amen to that. <laughs> 